Okay, so dear friends, colleagues, Your Excellencies, ambassadors, guests, everyone with us here in person and watching us our live event through Facebook and Delphi, I welcome you to the first Lithuanian Dutch Foreign Affairs and Security Conference here in Vilnius, Lithuania. My name is Justyna Skulis. I'm a project manager at the Eastern Europe Studies Center. I'm very happy that we, are, that we were able to organize this event uh, through a Gates partnership between our center the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Lithuania, and Vilnius University Institute of International Relations and Political Science. I want to thank everyone who worked hard to make this conference happen. Just yesterday, we marked 18 years of Lithuanian membership in NATO. It is a great feeling to discuss foreign and security affairs with our great allies from the Netherlands, a country that contributes a lot to protection of Lithuania. During the conference on the screen behind the speakers, you will see photos of brave Dutch men and women serving here in Lithuania within the NATO and Hates Forward Presence Battle Group. We Lithuanians are thankful for that. And now, without any further ado, I would like to invite the host of this beautiful venue, the Rector of Vilnius University, Professor Rimbudas Patrauskas. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador, dear colleagues, Honorable guest, during uh, the past few years, we have spent a lot of time adapting to the pandemic situation and thinking about the inevitable changes that this crisis will cause to our social lives. The events of February 24 suddenly shifted our thoughts to the geopolitical field and to more evident dangers. Danger to the European security architecture and democratic order created after the Second World War. The Russian invasion in Ukraine, the crisis in Belarus, and the destabilizing situation on the EU border have once again challenged our joint democratic values. Putin's regime is not only trying to destroy Ukraine as a sovereign country and Ukrainians as nation. nation. It is challenging the European Union and its unity. It is challenging the very conceptions that modern Europe was built on individual and social liberties, human rights, the international order, and agreements. Last but not least, the European cultural tradition and identity of Europe. In a way, European universities have become a field of resistance and are the first line of defense. As Ukrainians heroically defend their land, we must stand up for our values and our identity. And this means speaking and talking directly about what is right and wrong with our structures, in our countries, societies, in our institutions? As we condemn Putin's regime, we must honestly evaluate our security situation. We should acknowledge our convenient involvement in double-sided moral situation, cooperation with corrupt autocratic regimes and anti-democratic movements. We should acknowledge our mistakes and miscalculations. The Baltic states have long been warning about dangers from the East long before the war in Ukraine. Sometimes it was understood as looking just through historical lens, speaking emotionally of the ghost of Soviet past and not really understanding the rational game of economics and energetics that the West was trying to involve Russia in. It is important to emphasize that we were talking from the point of rationality from the perspectives of political science, political philosophy, as well as historical and cultural studies. It is important to understand that it is precisely this rationality and trust in academic debate and academic tradition, our trust in the humanities and social sciences, and the process of seeking the truth, it is that make us different from those autocratic regimes involving us in their strange political games. Wherefore, it is very important that we have a possibility to pause and discuss our common past, present and future by recognizing also our achievements and common efforts and to stand up for a civilized world. I am very glad that Vilnius University is becoming this open platform for discussions. I am also very pleased you are here ready to participate in this conference. I believe that this kind of of intellectual debates uh, are the right way to rethinking the current situation 
and our common future. It is trust in intellect and its unity with morality that makes us stronger, and I hope that our discussions will make us even stronger. So I wish you a great event and meaningful time sharing your ideas and insights in our historical Vilnius University. Thank you very much for your coming. Thank you, Professor. This event is possible thanks to the generous support from our great friends, Embassy of the Kingdom of Netherlands in Lithuania. I would like to invite Her Excellency Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Bonnie Horbach, for her welcoming remarks. Lavas Ritas, good morning, dear colleagues and friends. It is an honor that I welcome you to this first Lithuanian Dutch Foreign Affairs and Security Conference. First, let me express my gratitude to the Eastern Europe Study Center and the Vilnius University Institute of International Relations and Political Science for organizing and hosting this event. This um, conference creates the opportunity to exchange thoughts and ideas about the role and the position of the European Union in a changing world. The, uh, yesterday we celebrated 18 years of Lithuanians' membership to both the, the NATO and the EU. Through these memberships, the Netherlands and Lithuania are bound by a common security and common values. But we are faced with challenges. As the ambassador of Lithuania, I have experienced how this specific country and also this broader region has become the center stage of disruptive international developments. These developments are a test of our European systems, our unity and our mutual European solidarity. Only to mention a few of these recent developments. Last summer, uh, my, a migration crisis has put huge burden on Lithuanians' migration reception capacity, its border management, and the Lithuanian society as a whole. It was a hybrid attack orchestrated by Lukashenko's regime, but it was also a test, a test of European solidarity, a test that Lithuanians successfully passed by accepting support from other European states. Second, China has exerted immense political and economic pressure on this country after the approval of the opening of the Taiwanese representative office here in town. This again was and is a test of European unity. We, where does Europe stand vis-a-vis -vis China and how do, uh, do we avoid the singling out of a one member state? However, the most important and serious security concern to date is, of course, the war that Russia has waged on one of our most important Euro um, Eastern European uh, partners. Ukraine is under attack. This despicable and unprovoked war against the Ukrainian uh, people. In the wake of this crisis, we have to focus on what, united, uh, what unites us, not on what divides us. We do not agree on everything, but we agree on, on the most important thing. We will stand together in our support to Ukraine, both as NATO and EU, because together we are stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And without any other delay, I would like to invite the moderator of the first panel, Mario Shantanovic, and all of the speakers to begin our discussions. So 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Mario Antonovich from the Vilnius University Institute of International Relations and Political Science. So today we will talk about the current situation, state of affairs. As you know, 350 years ago, Lithuania was considered as a security threat, some sort of for the Netherlands, as shown by the, one of Rembrandt's paintings. Uh, now we are in the common family uh, in, the, in, in the European Union and NATO. Uh, both of them cover various security areas, so, so we will try to talk about how, how, how could these things uh, be, how to say, managed or enhanced or, or, or harmonized, let's say. So, so my first question, so because we don't have much time, unfortunately, so without further ado, I'll start with the first question for all the panelists. So the first will be, I mean, uh, I mean, just a few years ago, there were we had fears uh, when, when related to the presidency of Donald Trump that NATO was under threat, that NATO could be somehow be abandoned or reorganized. Now everything has changed very swiftly, right? So the USA is back. We have 100,000 soldiers. So the question is, so one part of the question is, uh, what uh, do we, does Europe need to do something? Maybe everything is fine. Maybe Europe should uh, uh, focus uh, further on such, let's say, soft issues like climate change or economic security, etc. But if not, so, so the question is, uh, uh, how to say, the question is, so what should we, should we uh, if not, so what, how can we persuade those European countries? Uh, just a second, I'm very sorry. I have everything written. So how should we proceed with that, right? So how should the EU cooperate with NATO in this situation? So I'll give the first, firstly for the experts because they are more free to speak and uh, for our diplomats, I'll give them time to a little bit to organize their thoughts. So first I'll ask Yeva Karpovicuta from Vitovtas Magnus University and the Lithuanian Military Academy. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to participate in, in this conference. Uh, and it is a great sign of uh, close cooperation between Lithuania and the Netherlands. Uh, this is really a, a very important moment in history, I think, of EU-NATO, the Atlantic uh, uh, region, and I think in, entire international community. And, uh, um, it is a very, very broad question how NATO and EU should adapt and what is the best recipe uh, to address this uh, security crisis and Russia's war against Ukraine. And uh, actually, I think that uh, uh, the EU and NATO, as they are, EU has just issued the strategic compass, which is a major strategic document of the European Union, and NATO is ongoing through the process uh, of the uh, strategic concept review. So uh, those documents are very, very important in addressing the security situation, security realities, and they have to have as close as, as it is possible perception on security threats on security threats. And we have to acknowledge that Russia is a long-term threat, long-term military threat, and adapt. So EU and NATO has to um, support each other in this adaptation process. So the close cooperation between the EU and NATO is very important, along with the focus on strong transatlantic link. Also, the cohesion and solidarity, as the ambassador previously mentioned, is very important. And it was demonstrated uh, with this reaction to Russia's war, to Russia's aggression against Ukraine. So NATO should primarily focus on collective defense, and it has to adapt its NATO defense and deterrence posture. And EU has to complement NATO's mission, NATO's collective defense mission, in um, opening, for instance, the defense initiatives to transatlantic co community and also contributing by different projects such as military mobility project or PESCO. So I think it's uh, like EU and NATO are getting closer uh, 
by addressing to this threat, and it is really a long-term approach, and we cannot stop and say that in one year everything will come back as it was a year ago. So there are major changes. Thank you. So I'll give the floor for our second expert from the Russia and East European uh, Center in the Netherlands, or the Netherlands Institute of International uh, relations. So, Mr. Bob Dean, so again, the question is how does it look from your perspective? How sh can the European Union and work and, and, and NATO proceed further in this uh, new s relation, new reality that we are here? here? Yes, thank you. So, thank you very much for the invitation to come to Vilnius. And it was really a, a pleasure and an, an extraordinary experience to be yesterday at the ceremony to mark the 18 years of NATO membership. Uh, and I spoke to some of my, uh, my colleagues back home uh, in order to tell them maybe we don't realize enough in the Netherlands how essential NATO is and how it is perceived here uh, in Vilnius and also in other countries in the region. I think that this type of conferences, I'm very grateful that we have this opportunity to also build a bit more mutual understanding about how we see the security situation. Because I mean, as we now all know, the world after February 24th is an, it seems entirely different as it was before. Uh, as, as Russian artillery shells and rockets are devastating Ukrainian cities, not only, I think, has the resolve of the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian military surprised the Kremlin, I think the resolve and the unity of EU and NATO will have surprised them as well. Because if you look back in a few weeks, things have happened that we would have considered not very plausible, let's say, not unthinkable, but not, not very likely up until this moment. Uh, and I'm just summing up a few and, and to help you understand also how, how quickly things are moving. Uh, the Germans who will spend 100 billion on defense and who have axed the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that they were arguing up to that point was a purely commercial project. That's a big thing. Um, the French president doesn't call NATO brain dead anymore. He is actively reinforcing the eastern flank of NATO. Sanctions that have hurting the taxpayers and the citizens in also Western European countries have been imposed very swiftly, actually, if you, if you look back. The American president participates in European Council meetings. That, that's a big thing. The EU is buying weapons and is giving it to Ukraine. Uh, I wouldn't have considered that plausible, uh, and I've worked for many years on, on these issues, uh, that the EU would actually use EU uh, the peace facility to buy weapons and give it to Ukraine. And Finland and Sweden are openly debating NATO membership in a much more open way, and also you see a shift in public opinion. These, I mean, we have a saying in Dutch that actually study, uh, students of physics often disagree with. We say that under pressure, everything becomes fluid. If you apply enough pressure, things should become solid, but actually everything becomes fluid. And things are extremely fluid at the moment. Uh, and for analysts, it's actually quite hard to make sense of what's going on because the, uh, the pace at which things are, are unfolding is amazing. But, let me say a few things uh, on your question. Uh, first, of course, Europeans realize that just because the United States is very committed to NATO and to European security doesn't mean that we can continue our geopolitical vacation and we can continue spending the peace dividend that we may have believed after the end of the Cold War uh, with a, a sort of breath of relief that we didn't have to spend much on defense anymore. Even in the Dutch parliament, not the most generous at times when it comes to defense spending, you see real calls for a rapid increase in defense expenditure. Uh, so the fact that we have to invest in our own security, that message has come home. I don't think it's, it's difficult to convince people of that argument anymore. But your other part of your question is much more difficult. Who should do what? Because very often the EU and NATO debate is framed in a rather artificial zero-sum way. It's EU or NATO. EU should do only this, NATO should do only that. And we often in the Netherlands say we disagree with this zero-sum approach. And of course, we have a mantra that the stronger EU leads to a stronger NATO, and, and everybody repeats that. But what do we really mean if we say that? So if you give me a few minutes to just unpack, uh, unpack this and also outline a few obstacles along the way, because just the fact that there's a lot of political will now doesn't mean that things are actually going to move as quickly as we would like to happen. So just on the distribution of responsibilities, if I can call it that, I think we've seen some of the threats over the last months and maybe year, year and a half, and we've seen how the different organizations have responded. I don't think anybody would argue that collective defense and, and uh, yeah, protecting the alliance territory, NATO is, of course, far better equipped to do that uh, in the highest uh, military spectrum, uh, much more than the EU 
which is more equipping itself for crisis management uh, and with, even with the rapid deployment uh, capacity up to 5,000, uh, which for the EU is a big step. That is, of course, very, very small compared to the type of capabilities that you need for collective defense purposes. Nobody would argue with that, also not in the Netherlands. Uh, but we saw that NATO had a harder time with things like the hybrid threats of the refugees uh, sent by Lukashenko. Uh, there you saw that the EU was actually uh, better prepared, maybe not well enough, but better prepared to handle this challenge. The use of sanctions as a mechanism for deterrence, these are incredibly far-reaching sanctions that we have imposed. NATO can debate them in the North Atlantic Council, but it doesn't have the machinery in order to design these sanctions in a way that really hit home, also to align it with sanctions on Belarus and to actually cooperate with the US and the UK in, in making sure that these sanctions work. Uh, you need the whole machinery of the European Union for that. Energy dependency, a point that for you and for us in the Netherlands is crucial. Uh, I think there the EU can make a major difference in helping us reduce some of our vulnerabilities to blackmail uh, or to the use of energy as a weapon uh, to compel us either not to engage in the Ukrainian conflict or to make other concessions. So what you see is basically the complementarity is coming almost naturally now. Uh, and we don't have to frame it in an either or debate anymore uh, to do that. And you already mentioned the strategic compass which acknowledges this, the complementarity and the, uh, the importance of not undermining NATO through the concept of strategic autonomy which I know is a concept that's not as popular here as it is in Western Europe. Uh, we still would like to speak about it at the Klingendal Institute, um, not in a way of replacing the United States as a security partner, but more in terms of making sure that we can handle crisis on our own, where the United States will either not be able or willing to engage, including in the southern flank, where uh, you see that we also struggle actually to, to meet security challenges. Um, so let me end with, with, even if this quantum leap forward that the European Strategic Compass likes to speak about, uh, that hasn't quite been taken yet, this leap, and I, I see four challenges in particular EU-NATO uh, cooperation that I think we should still debate here. The first one would be, that's an old, old issue, it's the not entirely overlapping membership question, and in particular the case of Turkey. The Turkey-Cyprus dispute will still make formal EU-NATO cooperation difficult, uh, but we hope that now, as things are unfolding, uh, maybe some of these old obstacles can also still be addressed. But of course, Turkey faces its own political situation in this year and the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. Let's say I'm still not entirely reassured that that problem will go away. So that's the first one, the, the challenge of how to accommodate this not entirely overlapping membership. The second is the American administration itself. I think President Biden has done an extraordinary job trying to preserve transatlantic unity uh, addressing the EU, making sure that everybody is on board. Uh, but of course, the memories of, you already mentioned the Trump administration, they are still there. And as the US, of course, also faces its own political uh, dynamics, let's call them, uh, let's call them that. Uh, I think it is still, it would be irresponsible for us to say that everything is now fine and everything will also be fine for the years and decades to come. Uh, so I think that is a second point that we should keep in mind. The third one, and I know the second panel will deal with it much more than, so I will be very brief, is China, the, where NATO will face some difficult discussions to finish up the strategic concept. Um, because there might be real differences of opinion again within the EU, and you are at the front line, you have your own experiences, what happens if China starts to leverage some of its economic clout to compel you to do certain things. But we should have a much more EU approach, and there it might get difficult to debate that also in the NATO context. And the last one, and here I would stop talking and actually would really prefer to, to start listening, is what kind of Russia will NATO face? What are we actually going to face in the years ahead? Are we going to face a very aggressive Russia that will try to impose its will on other non-NATO countries in the region, Moldova, Finland, um, or that will even threaten NATO members? Uh, here we should debate matters like the Suwaki Cap and Kaliningrad and things, uh, things like that where you have much more first-hand experience than, than we do in the Netherlands. Will we face an isolated, vengeful, resentful Russia uh, that tries to pivot to Asia, or, but that becomes a uh, sort of angry, but not entirely engaged with us partner anymore, uh, but a, a, still a very large part of the globe that we will have to deal with in one way or another? Or will we face an imploding Russia, which could also pose major security challenges for you, but also for us? And I think 
for all of these three scenarios are, are terrifying in their own way, actually, and we will need every analyst we have and we need every capability within the EU and NATO uh, to address it. Uh, but I always made a, a firm, uh, firm promise not to pretend to know Russia better than the Baltics. Uh, and I would be very interested in also hearing your thoughts on that last part. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much. So now the time has come for the policy makers to have their say. They have plenty of time to organize their thoughts. So first, I will give the floor to Mrs. Astaske Zgirito Leushkenia from the uh, palace, presidential palace, who is the advisor for, to our president on foreign policy issues. Yes, yes, no, yes. Okay, so we missed the, uh, the first part, okay. Um, thank you, Ambassador, for organizing this conference. Uh, all commands uh, go, go to you and Klingendale Institute and also Vilnius University and uh, Eastern European Study Centers. So uh, thank you for uh, getting us together to discuss this very important topic of uh, uh, common security. Uh, uh, so you asked about uh, uh, EU and NATO. Uh, cooperation and uh, uh, how it could be adjusted in this era. Uh, indeed, uh, some time ago, uh, we were uh, um, in the discussions how NATO and EU could function or could not function together because uh, there were countries in the EU who were very much for the strategic autonomy of the EU, saying that America is uh, out of Europe, that America does not want to play a role in Europe, so uh, uh, Europeans have to organize by themselves. Yeah? Uh, and indeed, every crisis is uh, an opportunity to grow as well as to get together. So I believe the first wake-up call was back in 2014, uh, when uh, the first attack uh, of Russia against Ukraine took place, Crimea and Donbas. Then there, there was a famous uh, gathering uh, uh, of NATO in, in Wales, in the United Kingdom. And there, if I may remind you, uh, it was absolutely agreed on two things, which, uh, which are now being implemented. 2% of GDP uh, per capita to defense for NATO countries and EFP to, uh, and uh, control and command structures in eastern flank. Uh, and there the things moved very fast and in two, in, in almost, in, well, almost two years, yeah, uh, the first EFP uh, um, groups uh, started to appear in Lithuania but also in other Baltic states and Poland. So um, things moved, but we had to have a second wake-up call, which you uh, also mentioned on the 24th of February, to really understand that uh, Russia is not getting away. Russia is there, it's getting more aggressive, and we have to deal with it, whether we want it or not. I must say that a lot of Europeans do not want to deal with war. We had a lot of wars. Uh, the Second World War, uh, I mean, Balkans had a war uh, much in much more recent times. In Lithuania, we did not have a war in back in the 1990s, but people were killed when our independence was restored. They were killed, the civilians were killed by Russian tanks. We have to remember that, just 30 years ago. So we, we, we do not want to go to war, but, uh, but uh, the situation is that, uh, that we have to deal with war. We're dealing with war in Ukrainian territory, and that's okay. We are taking, uh, taking sides. It's not that Europe can remain absolutely uh, indifferent uh, of what's happening between Ukraine and Russia. Yes, we are taking sides. Europeans are taking sides. NATO is taking sides. We are helping Ukrainians to, find, uh, to, to fight this war, and we're doing it because we understand that if Ukraine loses, next will be other countries. Putin will not stop. We have no uh, illusions about that. Some Europeans might have illusions about that. We don't, because we know them so well. So uh, indeed, it's uh, the war that, uh, that uh, democracy and values have to win. 
uh, and we should do everything to help this war to be won. Now back to EU and NATO. Yes, uh, the mantra, recent mantra is uh, uh, yes to cooperation where feasible, no to deprecation. And uh, uh, this mantra um, is okay. Uh, the problem is how it is implemented. Indeed, uh, cooperation, meaning that both organizations should work hand in hand. By the way, it was shown in Lithuania uh, in a very evident, explicit manner when uh, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg and uh, uh, European Commission uh, President Ursula von der Leyen came together uh, in face of uh, illegal migration crisis uh, uh, earlier, earlier last year. So uh, there were a uh, physical appearance of these two uh, lead figures of both organizations together to help us to deal with illegal migration. At that time it was illegal migration, so well, Europe perhaps was more instrumental uh, in, in, in that case than, than NATO. But now with the war, uh, NATO becomes more instrumental than Europe. Europe is complementary, helping with, yes, with sanctions, you are absolutely right. Yes, uh, dealing with hybrid, uh, other hybrid threats, uh, energy security, disinformation, propaganda, uh, or the fake news, strategic communications. Yes, this is also uh, where European Union can play a role and it plays a role and it's good. Uh, and you think, again, uh, what you mentioned, is that European Peace Facility is allowing to buy arms. That's a changing point because earlier, before 24 February, we could not imagine that European Peace Facility, which is by default peace facility, could buy weapons. So uh, this is a, a really turning point when European Union manifests as having ambitions to really create defense, not just security policy, but a defense. What, what is needed to be done yet is to achieve sufficient levels of, of, of defense by country by country. I mean, again, uh, uh, perhaps a banality, 2%, but not all European countries have 2% of GDP uh, for their, uh, their defense matters. Uh, so, uh, and again, a game changer was uh, German uh, uh, turning point when Germans said they will have 2% very quickly. They will give arms to Ukrainians. So uh, again, before 24 February, we could not imagine that Germany will take such a, uh, a robust uh, stance on, on this war. So again, a crisis, in this case, this war, is again changer. And uh, we are really, we are, um, we are in the point when things are still happening. So it is difficult to analyze in a, in, a, in a more analytical way because we are on the go. But again, for politicians, now is the time to act. Now is the time to click between NATO and EU to make the synergies work uh, for the benefit of us all, in this case, to win the war against Putin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so our last speaker, uh, Kestutis Vashkelevichus, who is the head of the government's uh, group on foreign policy and the European Union uh, from the office uh, chancellor of the prime minister. So again, your views, uh, who should do what and do we have to do more? Uh, Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, everybody. And, uh, uh, organizers in Vilnius University, Eastern European Studies Center, and then the Dutch uh, Embassy and Ambassador. Really very timely discussion. <clears throat> I would like to refer, first of all, to morality issues that uh, the rector of Vilnius University was speaking uh, at the uh, opening remarks, because uh, both European Union and NATO, first of all, are the community of democratic countries, and we took it for granted and these um, values or democratic uh, uh, principles were kind of you know, put aside in the peaceful times and that's probably why we were, both organizations probably sometimes put uh, more, uh, uh, more focus, not more focus, but maybe it was more visible those uh, differences that sometimes 
are natural among democratic governments. But of course, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, again kind of made us kind of crystal clear what are the strategic overriding priorities of both organizations. And I think that was the test of time, the test that Ambassador also was speaking, and uh, both organizations uh, passed this test. It was probably even more important, not just a test, but uh, a moment of 1938 moment of our, of our generations. And uh, we really successfully passed this one and nobody had any doubts. And this historical unity uh, that was shown by uh, EU and NATO leaders was unprecedented. Uh, President Biden visited Europe three times and probably it will be, not probably, but it will be soon the fourth time by the summer. And it probably shows also an answer uh, to, to the question that uh, uh, Marish asked, because the very visit of American president, uh, which has on his agenda visits to all the regions in the world, four visits in Europe, that probably is an answer to itself, the importance of cooperation uh, between EU and NATO. Uh, and not just on the heads of state level, we saw unprecedented cooperation and, and coordination among EU and NATO uh, recently in the last months. And this coordination is probably the key because we have to understand and assess security environment the same. Our understanding is uh, that foundation which uh, leads to the decision makers uh, and our policies. And uh, this one, I think, gives us really a lot of hope for the future that uh, EU and NATO cooperation will, will strengthen and uh, it will be rock solid. Of course, uh, it's not going to be that easy as, as, as the chief advisor to the president mentioned uh, because we'll come to the more details and uh, we'll have more discussions and that is natural. We should not be afraid of that. Um, we are glad that uh, the wording uh, autonomy uh, that was also mentioned here is not as uh, evident and uh, as spoken so widely as before because we have to, to, to ask the question autonomy from, from whom or from what? From United States, from NATO. Uh, and this, uh, the, 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 the recent discussions among you and NATO, it shows that this question is already probably uh, not on the table and the uh, recently adopted uh, strategic compass, uh, which was endorsed by the heads of states uh, uh, last week, uh, also pretty well focuses and shows on the importance of transatlantic link. And that is very, uh, very significant uh, uh, element in the strategic compass, as well as uh, our common understanding on the long-term security threats, first of all, of, of Russia. Uh, so this kind of, these few points illustrate that we, I think, on the, on the same page. And to you, NATO cooperation is, uh, uh, gives us hope that it will be, be strengthened even further as we look into the future. Thank you. So thank you very much. So I'll uh, I have to inform the audience that uh, after this round of questions, you will be able to uh, give, share your thoughts or uh, give some questions to our panelists. So, uh, but before that, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, ask my second question. So again, um, everything, ev everyone mentioned, right, this 2% uh, of GDP or most of you, uh, but, uh, uh, but again, this was, how to say, written in one, on the one hand uh, at the 2014 uh, NATO summit in Wales. On the other hand, as was mentioned, uh, there is uh, mm, different countries, not all countries that belong to the EU belong to NATO and vice versa, right? So like uh, not only Turkey, but for instance, Austria, Finland, Sweden, uh, now we have this, uh, some, some, some sort of situation in the Balkans. So the question is, how can we persuade, what can be done uh, to persuade the, our European partners, both from the EU and NATO, to invest those 2 percent? Because if we look now, 18 years after that summit, uh, not all of our students are performing their homework uh, properly here. And especially we have to take into account this context, what uh, 
the one political science from Cambridge University, Helen Thompson says, which we have now this politics of sacrifice, right? We have uh, they've had the pandemic, we have climate change, which is especially uh, well felt, I think, in the Netherlands, where you have to constantly fight to, to maintain your land. So, uh, what can we? So, how can be done? Can be done here. And again, another thing, and it was mentioned, right? Common military, common purchases of military equipment. Maybe we can. I mean, the EU need to do something else, right? Uh, I don't know, research and, and development, or, or some kind of common action. So, again, with the same with the same uh, uh, round. So, I'll ask Eva to begin. Thank you very much. Very important question, actually. And uh, I don't think that we have to convince uh, our allies and partners uh, uh, to invest more in defense. It is obvious, and they are making those steps, and uh, those steps are really very, very significant. But the question is about longevity, you know, uh, how in the longer perspective this adaptation, defense, uh, security adaptation will look like. So the, everybody understands that Russia is a, a threat now, and I have no doubt, and it is, it is obvious, and the solidarity, all those steps, all those uh, very, very strong uh, decisions upon the sanctions are, are approving that. And I would say that uh, we can uh, d divide the two levels you know, of, an, like, of analysis and of understanding, first of the national, uh, what nations are doing uh, uh, at the national level, so of course they're increasing defense spending, they're taking decisions to increase their defense, uh, also working on resilience and, uh, and uh, economic domain also very, very important. So when we talk about uh, European Union, so energy dependency is, is a very important issue. So countries have to, it, it's not only defense, but it's a very, very comprehensive approach to the challenges, to the threats the Europe is facing. So nation, at national level, the decisions are not, are not very easy, but at the same time, those national decisions, they contribute to regional level, to regional security. And uh, I think everybody is very well understanding it. In the regional, it is obvious that uh, uh, Euro Atlantic community, it's EU, NATO, and EU and NATO, <laughs> they have to adapt politically, economically, and militarily. So, this adaptation is the process that is very, very important, and uh, it, is, it will not last for one year. So, and how those three elements kind of interconnect, it is really will be a discussion and it will need a kind of broad political discussion for that. Uh, talking about and uh, going back to a uh, uh, colleague's uh, uh, remark regarding the Russia's threat and uh, how Russia will look in the future, so uh, I would say we should be realistic. Uh, Russia is quite consistent and as, as uh, Ambassador said that Russia is, is very consistent in, in its policies uh, in its military policy and its uh, doctrine and it is sending very very clear clear messages that uh, uh, euro atlantic uh, community is is not the, uh, the friend or partner and it it looks at your Atl euro atlantic community as to the adversary uh, so and uh, we have to adapt the, uh, EU NATO has to adapt, and and this is it. Uh, and another point I wanted to raise is very important moment. That it's not not only Russia, but the Belarus also is a factor of security. So Russia and Belarus are getting very closely um, interconnected, and Russia expands its area of um, influence. So that's why the level of threat is increasing and it cannot be ignored. Uh, so maybe I will stop here and pass. Thank you, so I'll give the floor for our uh, Dutch colleague. So Mr. Bob Dean, on your thoughts, how can, especially from your view, what is happening in Western Europe, how, how can we in this context of this politics of sacrifice expect uh, other countries to, 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 to make their commitments to military security on the continent. Yeah, thank you. Does it work? Yeah. 
Thank you. I think that awareness that the, the, the period of peace was over was already growing before this conflict. Uh, you already saw an increased willingness also in the Dutch public to spend more on defense. Uh, we realized actually in 2014 you mentioned but we should have actually taken the warning of Georgia 2008. That was in Georgia then. Uh, and Georgians like to remind me that, look, why did everybody go to sleep after this happened? You knew that Russia was willing to deploy military might to obstruct uh, NATO and other Euro-Atlantic aspirations. Uh, and Europe had actually said, and NATO had said, and I remember very fo uh, vividly in, in Tbilisi, had said there will be no business as usual with Russia after this. And it was very shortly afterwards that I think the French already signed a major arms deal with, with Russia. So. Europe has gone back to sleep, actually, at certain moments. And uh, also after 2014, I was in Ukraine then, uh, we, we snoozed too long. And I think that moment of, uh, of realization, it is very painful that it takes the, the shelling of Kharkiv and, and, other, and, and the attacks on Kiev for people to, to realize that now is the moment to really do it. But the momentum was already growing before that. Um, on the point of um, politics of sacrifice, we do opinion research at, uh, at Klingendal under the, under the Dutch public as well. Uh, and I underestimated, uh, again, the sentiments, that the, the polarization that exists also in our society, where you saw a sort of a certain part of the population, around 20% before the war, where these different lines that you mentioned, the climate, the pandemic, and Russia, they started to converge into one group that basically said, Ukraine could be a buffer state, uh, the pandemic is fake, uh, climate change isn't real, but it is a minority. The vast majority of the Dutch do realize that these are major threats, uh, also to Dutch security, actually. And you see a much uh, increased willingness uh, to, to also pay a price for this. Now, you mentioned already the energy transition. That is the price that people immediately have to pay and feel in their pocket uh, in rising energy prices. I understand they've gone up a lot here. They've also gone up a lot in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and so far, I haven't seen any resentment growing, saying, why did we get messed up in this situation? Uh, why do we have to pay this? People do realize that if you give them bad news, but you put it in context and you explain your strategy as well on how you want to deal with it, they are willing to shoulder this type of expenses. I think what they don't like is the feeling of loss of control and, and, and sort of slight panic. Uh, and with us, the most vivid example was the refugee crisis before when large numbers of people started to arrive and, and the population had the feeling that the leaders were not in control and were just sort of letting this happen. I, I think as long as we put forward a clear vision of how we want to challenge, the, uh, tackle the security challenges, you will see a willingness uh, for people to, uh, to also pay for this financially uh, and also to endure other hardships if they have to. Uh, I think we underestimate sometimes the resolve of our own populations because the Ukraine crisis really triggered something this realization that what you correctly mentioned, that war is there in Europe. Uh, for us, it was longer ago, but it, of course, reawakened all kinds of painful memories that we also had. Uh, and I, I think you will see, also when President Zelensky addresses the Dutch parliament this week, I think you will see a continued uh, resolve also of the, the politicians to continue investing. Now, what they should invest in, you, you will ask a follow-up question, I think, right? On, on, or not? It was part of it, but okay. you're welcome to answer, yeah. Just very quickly then, uh, because of course the temptation is to focus on the major platforms, on the main battle tank platform and the future, uh, the FCAS, the Future Combat Aircraft System. I think these are important, but what we should not underestimate, and I think <laughs> Russia's military failure in certain parts of Ukraine and it demonstrates the importance of logistics, of communication, of the enablers, basically, and uh, things that we should, and I'm very glad that the Dutch government is working actively also with your government on things like military mobility, uh, on making sure that you can deploy quickly to areas where it is needed, that you can communicate securely. Uh, we should invest in strategic airlift in, in things like that, not only stare at the main platforms, but also the intelligence that we need to make sure that they are, uh, that they're effective. Because I think that is what Ukrainians have showed to Russians really convincingly, how they can even listen in on their radio communications and how they can act on that. And then the last uh, couple of points, also the publics do understand that security is more than just lines on a map and deployment of, of military systems to deter the others. They understand that communications is vital. Space is also a security issue. It's a domain uh, that we should focus on uh, satellites. The fact that Russia blew up that satellite was also a wake-up call, uh, that actors can militarize space. Uh, the Arctic was in the program. I, I'll just name it briefly because it's of great importance to us also, the shipping lanes and maritime security. 
And I think after the break, you will speak also about the Indo-Pacific and, and China. Uh, but the sea lines of communication are, of course, also vital to our uh, economic security. And you already mentioned all the various hybrid threats where we can learn a lot from the experience of Lithuania and other countries in the region. Uh, because sometimes we feel that it's only state actors behind it, and sometimes it's criminal actors uh, paralyzing the port of Rotterdam with ransomware. Uh, and sometimes these two get merged in really complicated ways, and, and you need real intelligence and good experts to be able to not only disentangle these things, but even defend against them. Uh, so I think I'll stop here, but these are some of the, of the elements that I wanted to highlight in response to your question. Thank you. So thank you. So we'll follow the same order. So uh, Mrs. Astaska is Girita Rushkenia. So now the, your opportunity to answer the question. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes? Okay. Um, let me start by saying that um, um, 2%, um, percent does not resolve all and everything. That's the minimum that should be done. What else should be done in terms of defense policy? And this is a big question and uh, it was discussed uh, in NATO summits lately. There were two NATO summits just uh, when the war broke on the 25th of February. Um, NATO hold an emergency summit and l last week it was another summit, one month after, after the war. And in two summits, uh, it was absolutely clear that uh, the NATO countries have to organize themselves differently. Again, having in mind that the war is going already on. So it looked a bit like pledging conferences on two topics. First of all, how to help Ukraine Yes, in terms of arms as well, but not only. Even uh, such countries as Iceland, which said that uh, Iceland uh, does not have an army, so um, it cannot help in military terms, but it made all necessary political decisions to help in, uh, uh, in aligning with sanctions, in, uh, in, in uh, humanitarian aid, and so on and so forth. So every country wanted to contribute to the assistance uh, to Ukraine. And this was very good to see. Uh, even if uh, President Zelensky, who addressed NATO summit uh, in February, uh, uh, sorry, in, in, in March, uh, said that he's not getting enough from, from NATO countries. In fact, uh, NATO suggested it will give a lot. Yes, perhaps not enough, not yet enough, but giving, uh, giving a lot to help Zelensky to withstand. Now, the second question that NATO summits were, uh, were focused on is how to uh, increase uh, resilience in the eastern NATO flank. Again, uh, we know all that uh, Article 5 is sacrosanct, that attack against one NATO ally is attack against everybody. In practice, to God forbid the situation arises, we have to make some moves uh, that Article 5 is uh, operational. And there we have to make these moves, simple moves but necessary, to enhance defense in the Baltic states, in Poland, in, in Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and all these um, eastern flank states. Something more should be done before it's too late. So uh, again, uh, strengthening uh, eastern, flank, uh, eastern flank defense is uh, our primary task of all NATO countries because the war now is fought in Ukraine. The uh, division between democracies and autocracies is uh, the Lithuanian external border. Uh, it's 30 kilometers from Vilnius just 30 kilometers from Vilnius, because as you know, uh, Belarus and Russian integration, military also integration, makes it such that Belarus is a proxy of Russia and we cannot count on its uh, sovereign decisions anymore. So again, we have homework to do. We as NATO have homework to do and we are doing it. Uh, I must say that we are grateful to Dutch government on, on the recent, and parliament on recent decisions to increase uh, Dutch presence in Lithuania. Uh, you know, a friend in, in need is a friend indeed. So this is how we, uh, we really appreciate our allies 
by uh, concretely contributing to the security of, of, uh, of the Baltic states. But again, uh, understand me correctly, the security of the Baltic states is not a security per se. It's not just for us, it's for the whole alliance. And uh, uh, if we cannot withstand the security, that alliance indeed would be, would be dead. And this is something that I would not see to happen any time. Thank you. And Mr. Kistutis Vashkelarichus, please. <clears throat> Thank you. To your question, how to convince <coughs> societies, I think Putin is doing that job for us, uh, tragicomically, and it's uh, so better you should not be doing that. But um, I think today it's less and less this question uh, for our societies, should we in, uh, increase the spending, is, uh, faces less and less skepticism. Uh, but I wouldn't call it sacrifice, because uh, if you invest in roads, we don't call it sacrifice, but then, uh, as Ukraine example shows, the roads can't be bombed. Or uh, if we do not invest in uh, security, then we see how, due to the military uh, actions by an, by an aggressor, energy prices might go up, food prices might go up, God forbid, but a nuclear disaster might be also probable because Russia is unhinged in Ukraine. So if we ask these questions, how much it will cost environmental damage, food prices, energy prices, we see that security dividend pays a lot. So it's not a sacrifice, but it's an investment. So in the future, our societies uh, can raise in a stable, peaceful uh, times uh, into the prosperity. So this is mutually probably uh, mutually reinforcing. It's spending, it's not a sacrifice, it's not taking away from other sectors, but it's investing in other sectors in the long term. Uh, and this realization, I think it's coming more and more in, 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 in all the UN and NATO member countries and, and beyond. And that's why our countries, as, as Asta mentioned very well, all are already probably on the same page that we have to do uh, uh, what is needed to be done. Lithuania already increased uh, defense spending uh, up to 2.5% recently, uh, a week, two weeks ago. Uh, and as we are speaking today, uh, the parliament uh, of Denmark also is deciding on the uh, Danish contribution to the military you know, more presence, which like every day, every week, we are coming with the news, you know, starting from Germany's parliament, as you mentioned, you know, other countries, and it's like every day uh, spending, uh, defense spending is increasing. And this is important, of course, first of all, uh, in our view, because of Russia's threat, it's imminent, it might be existential, uh, and NATO's first and first, uh, first mission most important one is defense and deterrence of uh, collective defense of member countries, but uh, also EU and uh, <coughs> NATO countries have more challenges uh, beyond the European continent and, and Africa and, and uh, other continents. So we have to invest and to, to see these challenges ahead to be prepared. And our defense spending also sends a very powerful and strong signal of our commitment that we're serious about uh, the military and other challenges that we're ready to solve. Thank you. So thank you. So now there is an opportunity for the audience to give a question. If not, I have one on my reserve. So here, please. Thank you. My name is Vaidas Jonas Delphi. Um, just to, to follow up on what was said about zero sum approach to EU NATO and who should do what and uh, this little entertainment of thought that we should still sort of keep in mind the European strategic autonomy. Um, my major question is probably why? Why should we invest in, 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 in that at all, uh, given that uh, all European Union uh, drive towards any military security related areas has been a failure for the past uh, decade or so. If you take energy security, it's been a failure. Now we uh, see the, uh, the, the fallout of that with the energy insecurity crisis. 
uh, related with this war. Um, why should we do any of that uh, when the transatlantic link, when the NATO is the paramount, uh, uh, it's basically the most important thing uh, uh, that take, takes care of our security as evident on the ground right now. Um, and uh, when, we, uh, when we talk about the EU's role within diplomatic front, so, uh, for instance, uh, EU's mission to Moscow was uh, humiliation to European Union. Um, recent talks have been sort of a humiliation, again, for major European leaders, uh, but still this thought of European strategic economy pops up again and again. So the question is why? And when we saw the Afghan, Afghanistan crisis, the debacle of Afghanistan evacuation, idea pops up, we need uh, rap rea reaction forces. Again, why? We already have EU battle groups. We haven't been using them. I mean, we have not seen them in EU's eastern flank, if you wish. We have not seen them in Ukraine, the country that wanted and still wants to be uh, EU member state. And then we want another paper, sort of a project to justify more paper bureaucracy. Why? So perhaps a solution, maybe not a solution, not a sort of a um, direct uh, way to follow, but sometimes talk is good when it is applicable. Take uh, Ramzan Kadyrov and his TikTok troops. They talk a lot. Uh, they walk around in Ukraine. They film themselves. They shoot occasionally, sometimes at buildings, empty buildings. But then bas basically just uh, 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 attention queens and Insta queens. Uh, and uh, this is where they're good at. They talk, they talk their way, and they reap benefits of uh, what they do in that way. They don't really fight a real war, but they're effective in what they do. So maybe you should be effective at what it is, first of all, an economic union, first of all, to, to give uh, even the, um, the opportunity for Ukraine to, to be a member of the European Union in the future, to speak more clearly, to invest into that direction rather than into the area which it has since failed so far. Thank you. So I suspect this was a question for a Dutch colleague, probably. <laughs> I'd, be, uh, I'd be delighted to engage with you in the debate. As someone who's worked in uh, EU uh, civilian missions, actually in, uh, in the Caucasus, uh, there are definitely reasons why I could see why you would want to say that, because I have seen EU initiatives flounder on the altar of bureaucracy and infighting between different departments, and I'd be the last to go out and say that it's a super effective organization that can handle all the challenges uh, without any problems. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to say, let's make more of what we have. Uh, I fully agree with you. But I think we would be naive if we would not admit that the EU is not only a political and economic community, it is a security community, whether we like it or not. In fact, there is an EU Article 42.7, which says very clearly, and Finland and Sweden have very recently reminded us of that uh, in writing, that there is also a mutual assistance clause within the EU. And many of the security threats that we face are mixed threats. So we are now, of course, focusing on the large-scale conventional warfare in Europe. I would fully agree, don't try to make the EU into something that it's not. It's not a military alliance. But it faces so many challenges where it needs to apply a whole set of tools in order to address them properly. The hybrid toolkit that is in the, in the strategic compass, I would hope we can give that a chance that we can actually try and bring all these different EU instruments together, bring together the cyber teams, or bring together with Frontex and all the other specialized agencies. I don't think we have actually seen how effective it can be if it really faces one of those, uh, those hybrid threats. Uh, I would also say that, you know, I agree with you that it's very hard to deploy things like the EU battle groups, uh, because there's always one country somewhere in the EU that disagrees with it in one way or another. But again, Strategic uh, Compass speaks about Article 44, something that Klingendal has argued for many times. You can do things as EU with missions that don't require the participation of every single EU country, even though I understand even Denmark is now debating its defense opt-out, uh, because Denmark is sometimes you know, making the point that they, they have to opt-out, they don't want to participate. So on the EU not being able to do it and therefore shouldn't try, 
there I have to really disagree with you, because I feel that the EU should actually try harder, not give up trying. On Kadyrov, uh, I would even ask, uh, was he even in Ukraine? Where was he actually? The last picture I saw, I think he was sitting in front of a gas station in Russia, but I wasn't sure because you never know with pictures uh, these days. And the point on Ukraine as EU member, I think that debate, it, it's an important one to have, and I'm not sure if you want to do that now, but I'd be happy to say, to say a few words on it, because here for the Netherlands, it's a complicated matter given the referendum that we had. Uh, where this was an odd referendum, and I will not defend it in any way, because it, was, it wasn't actually meant to target Ukraine specifically. It happened to be the first uh, treaty where this referendum could be applied in 2016. Uh, but it was still there, and it led to a rather ugly debate in my country that I, uh, I was shocked to see. Uh, and it had to do also with, to do with not enough knowledge about the region for this debate to happen properly, I think, in, in our society. And we learned from that, that we have to make sure that people really know what they're discussing before they vote on a referendum on something as meaningful uh, as, at that point, not membership, but an association agreement. Here, I think it is risky if we apply the lens of, let's just add Ukraine uh, to the EU now as a matter of solidarity. I think it is risky, not because I don't feel Ukraine belongs in that community, as does Georgia, as does Moldova, as do other countries of the Eastern Partnership, actually, because I would not only focus it on, on Ukraine, that debate. But I think it is risky if we, we forget the other important tool that the EU has in its toolbox, which it hasn't applied always very well, including in the Western Balkans, which is to help countries undergo these domestic transformations that they really want to do, but sometimes struggle to do in practice due to vested interests. I spent over a decade of my life trying to help Ukrainians reform all kinds of things, and I know very well how vested some of these interests are. And they're not quite there yet, but I hope that this new momentum and this new sense of, of common purpose that Ukrainians have found fighting Russia will also translate in a sense of common purpose fighting some of the problems that are not caused by Russia inside Ukraine, which we should also be, uh, be honest about. So I think it would be a pity, as we say in Dutch, to throw away the baby with the bathwater and say the EU hasn't been effective, therefore let's stop trying. Uh, I would say let's try harder. Thank you. Do you have any more questions from the audience? Okay, I can't see anything. So one, does do our, any Lithuanian colleagues want to add something on strategic autonomy? Okay, if not, so I will uh, ask one more question because we still have time. So I think the problem that I see is that when we're talking on the eastern flank, we have Russia, a unitary actor, very centralized, I would say over-centralized, who makes decisions quickly, swiftly. And on the other hand, we have a multilateral alliance, two huge organizations, uh, and you can, we can just point out two, two examples, right? So where, which makes decision-making is longer, it takes time, uh, some kind, some, some, someone may say I veto or something. And uh, you have like, f in the NATO uh, framework, you have Turkey, which was mentioned, which was not, which has so even does some kind of, uh, let's say, not very peaceful operations in the Caucasus, I mean, in the Karabakh war, or we have Hungary, right? Because if we, if the difference is, right, is that Germany says, we, okay, we, we are not ready, but we'll get to energy independence from Russia. Hungary says, we are not even thinking about it. So my question is, how can we operate on this, in, in this eastern flank, right, uh, in, in, in this kind of uh, situation, right? So I'll probably f give the floor first to Yeva, and then maybe someone else would like to add here something. Yes, uh, I see what, what you mean with your question. It's, I, I wanted to highlight that the unity of NATO, if we talk about decision-making process of the alliance, and it is very important, and I don't see that we need to talk about separate, I don't know, territorial subregions that have to be more important than others. Uh, the, uh, the center of NATO, the strength of NATO is uh, uh, collective de de defense and at the same time the principle of decision-making consensus. And consensus is uh, when everybody agrees or everybody equally disagrees, the balance. And when NATO takes a decision, it is really very, very strong for NATO itself and for, for the uh, external audience, let's put it that way. So NATO, over the many, many years, uh, NATO developed the practice of decision-making and all those decisions are being taken by consensus. All the allies are agreeing and uh, we have really, uh, I don't know, so, so many 
historical, you know, moments when NATO managed to adapt to the challenges that were stemming from outside of NATO and from inside, and we proved that NATO is uh, is a really strong collective defense alliance. So I think that this decision-making process and the practices that were established and evolved over the time, they are making it really valuable and uh, practically uh, important. So this, I, I believe in unity of NATO, actually. Mr. Bob Dean, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Okay. I'm speaking at length, so. No. Oh, sorry, sorry. So maybe no, our, our, our diplomats maybe have well, to add. I also so agree yeah. uh, to the unity of NATO, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, uh, but again, very last point. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. the situation in Hungary. Is, mm -hmm. is our only way to make sure that Hungary trans allows its territory to t for weapon transfer is to wait for an election? Or do we have any other instruments, how to persuade them? So anyone who can volunteer to answer this question? Uh, not maybe directly to the answer to the, this question, but uh, I think that's also coming back to this, uh, what we s uh, started to talk at the beginning about uh, uh, close coordination and consultations between all allies, both in the UN NATO, because once Russia's invasion cleared our minds what are the danger and what actions are needed, then we were able to adopt those actions much quicker. And I think even Russia itself didn't expect such a swift reaction implementing sanctions by the EU, NATO's reaction, etc. So it showed that during the times of crisis, during the times of war, we are able to do that. It's a good example. Of course, we'll not never ever be able uh, to compete regarding the speed of dictatorship. It's not our purpose, uh, but uh, we have, I think, to learn lessons how to be as effective as possible and even build it up on this, I would call a good example, once uh, we adopted sanctions and other decisions, building up how to make this process even more speedier in times of crisis. Okay, thank you. So, does anyone has to add something? On Hungary, you mean? Oh, I mean on multilateralism versus unilateralism or Hungary or something like that. I mean, what we, we, where we have outliers and we, these outliers do not even want and they are not even planning not to be outliers, right? So, they, 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 they are not even planning to Mm, join the consensus like that. So we, we have certain countries on the EU level and on the NATO level, and this also, how to say, complicates this potential cooperation between these two organizations. Yeah, well, I'd be happy to volunteer a few thoughts. I used to work in a multilateral organization with the 57, uh, all of them with a veto, uh, OSC, and, uh, and we would have the Holy See blocking anything with the word gender in it, and we would have Russia blocking anything with other words in it, and I, it's very, very hard to come to any type of agreement with, with that type of uh, conglomerates of, of not entirely like-minded countries where you have to agree between uh, Tajikistan and Canada on, on certain texts, right? But it can still be done and that's why diplomats are there. That's what they do. They find compromises. But there are points when a compromise just doesn't work. Now, and if I can name one personal example, I used to work with um, uh, the Hungarian minority in Ukraine, which was one of the reasons why Hungary was blocking certain NATO-Ukraine meetings. And it was incredibly difficult. And what I would really like to add, and it's a very personal note, it's not a clinging down or opinion, is to try and avoid countries hijacking broader security matters, such as Ukraine-NATO relations, over bilateral issues, such as the level of autonomy of Zakarpatia and the uh, city of Ushkorod and, and, and the Birgovo district. Right. But I've seen that happen over and over again, also in the context of the Western Balkans. I can name quite a few countries in the EU that are imposing strict conditions on candidate countries that want to get closer to the EU and have to deal with certain minority issues or with other bilateral issues. And here I think it is important that we keep the greater good in mind. Uh, and that countries are convinced that there is a cost to this type of unilateral behavior inside the EU. It is a community of values, as you very rightly pointed out, uh, and there should be consequences if you go blatantly against those values. Now, Klingendal is, of course, not the Dutch state, so we can recommend that we want qualified majority voting on a number of things. And I would start with the human rights sanctions mechanism. I think if we can't even agree on that, I was very disappointed when Cyprus started blocking the sanctions on Belarus for something entirely not Belarus-related, and they still did it. 
I think it is time that we actually say on this type of issues, given that we're a community of values, we can go one step further and make this a qualified majority vote and cede a little bit of, not even sovereignty, because it's a sovereign decision to transfer this to, to QMB. But I think we should do that. Uh, anyway, last point. Okay, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Netherlands have uh, created this concept of total football, where the first <laughs> attacker is the first defender, and the first defender is the first attacker. So we had this opportunity to create the concept of total European defense, uh, where Which we can learn from Finland. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so, 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 hopefully, in that spirit, Lithuania and 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 the Netherlands will continue further in in, in establishing ties and making an impact on continental European defense. So I thank all of our panelists, so all from my right. So again, Mr. Bob Dean from the Netherlands Institute of International Relations, Staskis Griti Lushkierny, sorry, the chief advisor for to the president on foreign issues, foreign affairs, Kestutis Vashkelavichus, head of the International Relations and European Union Group at the Chancellor of our Prime Minister, and Mr. Yeva Karpovichute from Vitotas Magnus University, I thank you very much all and I'll give the floor for the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, okay. so thank you very much and we'll call for a five minutes break. I didn't know which direction the discussion was.
New York City Center, as well as a government speech analysis center. Um, and here with me are two speakers instead of the pan three. I'm very sure to inform that uh, our third panelist, Professor Ramona Sosotopoulos, uh, got COVID and uh, could not attend. In all that, amidst all the crises that we have, we still have that one. Uh, and it's taking its toll. But we do have two great speakers. Uh, we have uh, Ramona Sosotopoulos uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the External Economic Relations and uh, Economic Security. Thank you for being here. And we have uh, Dr. Mike uh, Altano Hamas uh, from the Kingendal uh, Institute and a senior policy research fellow there. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome you both to Lithuania, uh, to uh, the Aula Parva Hall. And yeah, um, I think we'll structure the, the talk in a slightly different manner. We'll have uh, some time for the introductory remarks. Uh, for both speakers to share their thoughts. Then I'll react very quickly, have some prepared questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, and, yeah, and there is a lot to discuss when it comes to European trade policy and just generally global economic relations as it happens. It feels like there has been a lot to discuss even before the most recent crises, but uh, you know, before the Russian war of aggression on Ukraine, there was COVID and its disruption of global value chains. But even before that, we had uh, the China-US trade wars and the larger tensions surrounding the future of the multilateral trade and investment system. Um, we had an uh, increasing politicization of trade already for 20 years, probably the seminal, you know, the pictures of Seattle WTO protests. So that's been going on for a while. We have uh, increasing concerns about the lack of level, level playing field between countries that really strictly follow rules based um, regulations and those who maybe not so much. Um, and we have climate and digitization, changing the fundamental parameters of our economies and our societies. And all of these questions beg responses. So there's a lot to cover, and I don't want to put any constraints on my panelists' uh, you know, first initial speeches, but I'll try to react, and then we can take it from there with more pointed questions. Um, so maybe just going one by one, I will open it up with uh, uh, Mr. Alashovka. Introduction, I think he just made already some initial steps uh, and present. Yes, does it work now? Okay, good. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. You made already some good uh, comments introducing our, introducing our second panel. And uh, following on this, and definitely agree that today we speak uh, under the very difficult circumstances because we have a war going very close to the borders of EU and uh, very close to Lithuania and other countries. And uh, obviously, we cannot, we cannot avoid in any way uh, the, the current situation. But also, you mentioned some challenges that, that, that you faced recently. I mean, challenges posed by China and also challenges posed by the uh, COVID pandemic. And, and these are, th I think, the major challenges that shaped uh, that shaped EU trade policy in the recent years. And of course, the, the, the war in Ukraine brings another layer of difficulties and brings additional questions uh, about our future relations with, with third countries, about the future of international organizations such as the World Trade Organization. Uh, very briefly, looking into the title of, of the panel, and then after seeing the title that it's named about trade uh, economic wars, uh, I felt certain resistance inside, because obviously, well, it goes, uh, European values are very different. For, for Europeans, our values starts from the free trade, from the economic integration, from the economic stability, and I think all of us remember uh, how the multilateral trading system was created after the Second World War. It was created just because to build the Europe, to support the Europe, to bring again the trust uh, among different countries. And also after decade, we saw how the European economic integration started. And, and, and then so this is our common values in the EU that starts with the free trade. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite obvious that the instrument of free trade 
uh, you used quite effectively for many decades, signing new agreements in different regions, uh, even in the neighboring countries. Let's speak, uh, spent a few words uh, speaking about Balkans, for example, Stabilization Association Agreement, deep and comprehensive agreements uh, with our neighboring countries. For many years, that was probably the main instrument that the EU was using when we speak about the trade policies. But then recent years, unfortunately, we've seen some global changes, some shifts, and we, we saw how some countries started to use economic relations as, as a tool. Uh, we, we heard quite strong aggression rhetoric and aggression, and also economic coercion. And then we can look back and then, I think some of us, we still remember the situation, what happened, what happened when the Ukraine signed association agreement uh, with the EU and the claims posed by Russians at that time, mm -hmm. speaking about economic consequences and losses, which, which is absurd, I think. Uh, also, it's quite obvious, Lithuania faced some um, economic aggression from Russia. I mean, our data sector, transport companies, and most recently, the economic coercion from China, caused again by, by policy choices that Lithuania, that the government of Lithuania adopted. Then, speaking about China, I think many countries, many European countries, had similar. Uh, similar stories, similar reaction from China because of, of, of policy uh, choices, but these reactions were not so broad in this scale on, on economic terms, or when speaking about different uh, companies that are located in the EU. We have quite a number of European companies that, I don't know, from, from Adidas, H&M, and others who faced some measures by the Chinese government just last year so all these changes, all these shifts uh, helped Europeans to understand that we shouldn't be so naive and that, need, that we need a broader instrument, speaking about the common commercial policy, foreign trade relations, uh, that it's not enough just negotiate trade agreements with different countries or continents, that we need additional tools and, and recently, we've seen some legislative changes and some legislative initiatives that started and some instruments already enforced. Um, I'm speaking about the uh, screening uh, regulation that imposes the uh, screening mechanism of foreign direct investments. Um, I'm speaking about the draft regulations, which, which is currently debated which speaks about effects of the foreign subsidies in the EU domestic market in terms of procurement, in terms of competition law. Um, I'm speaking also about anti-coercion instrument, uh, which also is currently debated. And there are additional instruments, for example, procurement instrument recently adopted, which will help EU in the future probably uh, negotiate the uh, procurement, public procurement market access in the foreign countries. So, at the same time, we have a number of mega agreements concluded recently, Japan, Canada, etc., uh, and some other agreements which are still currently negotiated with, uh, with Australia and New Zealand, for example. But at the same time, Europeans, we understood that, that free trade, uh, functioning of, of market economy, it's, it's a huge value that should, be, that should be protected using very different instruments. Uh, speaking about the future and then a few, uh, a few remarks about the future, I have no doubts that, uh, that the war in Ukraine will bring the additional layer into our consideration about the future economic relations with the different countries. I'm not, I'm not speaking about China, first of all, and then I'll, I'll, I'll have a few words on China in a minute, but um, I'm speaking about some other countries and relations, and, and for example, what about Brazil? What about, what about uh, India? What about Serbia, which is a succession country? 
uh, which in the accession process in the EU, and I think our future relations, future political and economic relations with these countries will be strongly affected by the stand that these countries will take under the current, under the current uh, situation. Um, also about, well, the question also comes about the future of uh, international economic organization, and namely the, the World Trade Organization, as I said. Recently, the Foreign Affairs magazine published an article questioning whether the war in Ukraine means an end of globalization and what will be the consequences on the global economy. Mostly, they speak about economic sanctions, but I think speaking about economic sanctions, we saw very coordinated actions by the number of countries, by the US, EU, but also Japan, South Korea, Australia, and others. And then previous, a previous panel spoke about, about the uh, time needed to take the decisions. But I think these examples that they used, they spoke already about the fourth or even the fifth package of the sanctions. But uh, looking into the, well, looking at, uh, at, at what happened at the end of February, when, when the war started, I think the first reaction by the number of, of countries uh, was very coordinated and, 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 and we saw also the quick reaction. So, well, my question coming back to the, to the future about the globalization is about the future of international organizations. And I don't, I, honestly, I don't have answer, but I think I'm not, I'm not also very optimistic about the future of these organizations because it's, 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 it's really difficult to imagine Russia, Ukraine, and some other countries sitting in the same meeting room as we have today and then speaking, uh, creating or discussing the global trading rules or, or some other issues. And I think quite clearly we saw quite recently, we saw some moves from a number of WTO members which announced that they will stop uh, using so-called so most favored nation treatment uh, for Russia. Also, I think the country started even to, to speak how to expel the Russians from the organizations because it's, as I said, it's difficult to imagine them being an ordinary member of, of, the, of the international society. And I think my last points and very few points on, on, on China. Um, as I said, I think the relations of EU with China are more more complex. We don't have a straightforward answer. I think a lot, a lot will depend on the meetings which are happening today and also, I mean, a meeting on, of the uh, Foreign Affairs Minister of Russia and with his counterpart of China and also EU-China summit on Friday. I think personally, I think that the Chinese are not, that, that they are too clever actively support support Russians under the current circumstances. But well it's difficult to predict what would be the price that they will ask Russians to pay to get the support. So we're acting under these situations. But I think also whatever happens, EU is not naive anymore if we speak about our future relations with China, and I think we have already a number of trade policy tools which will help in our future dialogue with, with China. I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, thank you very much. Thank you so much, and uh, I will ask for any, I'll invite any kind of responses afterwards, but now uh, on to uh, the prepared remarks of Dr. O'Connor. wonderful introduction. There's many things I, on, on trade that I definitely don't have to uh, discuss anymore. Um, but I would also like to, to create the link with the previous panel. I think it's so interesting that we, we, we just heard uh, the first panel focus uh, obviously on, on security challenges, uh, on the EU and NATO, uh, on the war in Ukraine. 
Um, and now a second panel on e economic issues or trade issues, uh, as per the title of the panel at least. Um, and then a focus on China. And I think it's interesting to see some parallels where we see uh, strategic autonomy is an issue in, in both fields, right? Um, the politics of sacrifices, that's certainly an issue that we are also having to discuss in our relationship with China. Um, and the morality or, uh, or the values or the ideal, ideological debates that come with this uh, and the divides between, do we call it democracies versus autocracies or do we call it like-minded countries and, and other countries? Uh, very important ways of, I think, also framing this. Um, then the issue of spoilers. I see also similarities with what with the end of the, the, the previous panel. And then, of course, the, the role of the United States as, as a key partner, um, of course, much more present in, in, the, in the way that uh, they also are a, a key NATO member, um, but also in the economic field, increasingly uh, active in, in pushing EU member states to, to adopt certain economic policies. Uh, and I think of uh, 5G networks and should we or should we not allow uh, Huawei to, uh, to also be part of the, our telecommunications uh, networks or to build those networks works for us. So there's many similarities, I think, that's, that's really interesting. I don't, I don't usually join security debates, um, so that's a great opportunity uh, even. Um, another sort of starting point uh, that I would like to highlight, uh, because this is my first time to, to Lithuania, um, so, and it's a great timing, of course, because much of the, uh, the economic issues that we're dealing with in an EU context uh, with China, uh, Lithuania plays a key role, and the economic coercion uh, on Lithuania and on the whole of the EU, actually, um, after, because this is much more than a bilateral uh, thing between uh, Lithuania and, and, uh, and China. It's, it has become, because of China's disproportionate um, co responses, very much an EU issue also. Uh, and, and understanding that better and, and seeing also from a Lithuanian perspective the parallels with where Taiwan stands, um, Taiwan within uh, Asia, of course, uh, in the backyard of China, uh, not quite 30 kilometers away from, uh, from mainland China, but, uh, but definitely also extremely close, um, just a small part of the sea that is, that is dividing the two. Um, and there's the ideological, of course, also uh, divide between uh, the two, between mainland China and Taiwan. Uh, there's the, the, goal, uh, the, the, big, the big guy and then the small, uh, player that is trying to stand up um, between there's the uh, the historical uh, sentiments that play in very much uh, so there's a lot of sentiments so I'm starting to understand a little bit better perhaps why uh, Lithuania chose uh, what it uh, to do what it did uh, in, in in actually naming this uh, or allowing the Taiwanese to name that new office the Taiwanese representative office there's many questions that I would still love to ask um, of our uh, Lithuanian uh, to our Lithuanian friends to, to even better understand because uh, the devil is in the detail here. But, but I can totally see how you sympathize with the Taiwanese um, in their fight to stand up against China and to defend actually our democratic uh, values. And that, that also for you, you know, took, uh, it came relatively more recent uh, and, and then you want to really stand up for. Um, so that's a really interesting thing uh, just for me to, to be present here. And I think important also because as we move forward as, as the EU, um, unity is needed more than ever. Uh, also in our relationships with China, in economic policies. Um, and uh, understanding of the dividing lines between us uh, is, I think, extremely important. I think Bob called it mutual understanding. Um, that's, of course, a different way of saying it, but dividing lines, because we are all different, um, and understanding also each other better, I think will help us to get to better policies. Because the history that you have with Russia, uh, we are not oftentimes uh, su uh, sufficiently uh, sensitive to. Uh, but perhaps, for example, dealing with Taiwan is something that is newer for you and that you could benefit from, from engaging with uh, some of the European countries that have more experience with that. So again, and then the economic dependence of the different countries and how that informs their policies. Uh, is also, of course, uh, very different. I think the reason why Lithuania also joined 17 plus 1 a few years ago, ago because it was because, uh, well, maybe you didn't realize that in Brussels this was perceived as a disunity on the EU uh, side, uh, that it could divide EU policies, uh, but also the opportunities that I think Lithuania was trying to reap from China's economic rise and growing presence in Europe, 
Um, and that's, in a way, from where you stand, only uh, um, understandable, but it came at a very awkward time to us because we were getting more worried about Chinese investments, which were intruding also in our, uh, in some cases at least, in our critical infrastructures. So understanding those positions better, I think, will lead to, to better policies. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to have dialogues like this. Um, so three key points that I was wanting to make. Um, indeed, the bigger context is trade is no longer about trade. That was already said 10 years ago. Um, and then we started to look differently at multilateral uh, trade agreements. Um, and, but in the past three to five years only, so that's very recent in a way, I think economic policies and China policies have gone through a paradigm shift. It's truly a paradigm shift, and that's really big. Um, in the Netherlands even, uh, where we have a very, you know, a, a rich tradition of wanting to have, you know, the market come first and uh, a liberal uh, capitalist country. Um, industrial policy has been a taboo for a very long time. I spent quite some time in, in Asia uh, 10 or 15 years ago already, and I realized that, you know, the world is changing and the world is coming also, that world is also coming to, you, to the EU. So that clash of capitalism that we are in now, we had to prepare for. You could see it coming already back then, but arguing for it in the Netherlands, uh, it was um, basically silence to death. Uh, no way that you could discuss, uh, for example, um, investment screening 10 years ago. Now that is very different today. And I think understanding that shift that the Netherlands, a very profound shift that the Netherlands has gone, is, is going through still, um, and also understanding where we do want to change and where we really want to protect that uh, open market, is, as you said, is so important, the free market uh, system. Um, that is something that uh, is difficult also between uh, EU or between EU partners, it's also difficult within the country because uh, well, in, I think uh, foreign economic affairs is where you are at. People, when I speak to those people in the Dutch, now foreign ministry, used to be economic ministry, uh, they have very different views from, for example, the, the China uh, people uh, division. And that's both, of course, uh, Dutch policy that they are creating and they have to co-create this new industrial policy. So that's a paradigm shift. Also in China, I think uh, the Netherlands has been actually uh, a very big proponent of, of change. Uh, beyond naivete, as you would call it, uh, China is a systemic rival, is not quite the words that we have used, but it's basically uh, exactly that. Um, and, and very shortly after the EU came out with that change in policy, um, also the Netherlands was the first to come up with a China policy. Um, so we have also been driving that change uh, within uh, the EU. And we are doing that also now in terms of indirect China policy. And that is what I would also like to put on the agenda here today. Um, can we or should we not also be discussing uh, indirect China policy a little bit more? Because we all realize now, just like Russia is not listening or, you know, to our arguments because they have a very different view of the, of the world, so they're not going to become the kind of country that we would like them to become. So rather than being hopeful of their change, we should also work with other partners uh, offering them alternatives. Uh, in, in China, of course, in its own region, it's very active in offering the Chinese way of doing on surveillance, perhaps, um, and of organizing your political system and, and economies uh, in a much more closed way, state-controlled way, state-steered way. Um, should we not invest more in offering them alternatives? Because if we want that a world with, where democracy, or at least, um, well, different varieties of that and, and more open economies, if we want more of that, uh, we need to invest not just in ourselves, not just in the protect agenda, which I think in the past few years, as you highlighted, the EU has been very much investing in and quite successfully. Um, that internal protect agenda is, is well on our way, but the external promote agenda, as I would like to call it, so the offensive uh, policies of offering countries alternatives, actually appealing from bottom up what the uh, benefits are of a free and open economy, uh, of uh, transparency and freedom online, also in the digital domain, uh, because we don't want closed societies on the internet, um, and helping them to achieve that, um, is, is, I think, also a very important part of our, what I then like to like call indirect China policy. So that's broadening from just the trade promotion uh, or the trade agenda that I think you, uh, you put up for discussion here. 
Um, but I think, I, I hope that we could discuss also with the audience that, that other side, uh, because there's quite a few things happening here also in EU context. Um, Global Gateway, perhaps uh, some of you may be familiar with, that's, that's an example, an attempt of the EU at that indirect China policy, um, external promote agenda. Um, how to get that right? Uh, is a very difficult one. And what is the role of the various member states? And how does that connect to our focus now, which is very understandable on the Ukraine? Um, is that sort of renewed shift towards the Indo-Pacific and the Global Gateway Agenda that the EU was really um, getting to? Um, should we be, not be careful also to, um, well, to have too little attention to that? because that would be focusing, uh, well, on the immediate challenge now, which is also a long-term challenge, but overlooking perhaps the long-term challenge that's coming from farther away. So I'll leave it to that for now, thank you. All right, well, thank you so much uh, to both speakers for their introductory remarks. And uh, I'll try to actually combine um, a few questions that I would have asked individually into one bigger one so that you could both take a turn maybe from your perspectives, but I will um, specifically react to your concern about the future of the international organizations and to uh, your uh, just recently made point about the external and direct China policy, more generally external promotion. And specifically, you know, um, I think these, these connect in a certain way. Um, on the one hand, you have EU activities such as the Global Gateway, such as the overall in the Pacific uh, um, strategy, uh, its continuous work with Asian, with the African Union, etc., building out alliances, building out networks uh, between countries that themselves elect to cooperate under some sort of rule-based uh, regional orders. And so trying to, you know, um, structure economic cooperation in that way. And on the other hand, the EU has been, for some time now, positioning itself as the promoter of the interests of not only the Northwest, uh, you know, of global states, but also a partner to the developing world in terms of, in the context of uh, the reform of multilateral organizations. It has, during the increasing contestation over the WTO, it has positioned itself as uh, somebody that wants to also hear and be receptive to the interests of those that were not necessarily so empowered by the organizations and work with them. And it has said in the past, uh, the commission has said it many times, but also different member states, they're perhaps better positioned than the US which is very negatively perceived in some countries, but also that maybe doesn't have the historical ties, um, to help to speak with one voice. So I think that these could be two big pillars of the you know, external promotion and setting the scenes, working not against the key opponents, but with partners or potential partners. So I was wondering if you, know, you could both talk about uh, how these two things can go in parallel, what the current track record is, is the global gateway in its current form enough? What are the crucial first initial tests of how this approach works or doesn't work? I mean, obviously, um, the next meeting with African, uh, the African Union is called the proof of concept of the uh, global gateway, so we will be looking at that. But also, you know, there's such a long stall debate on, you know, breakthroughs, potential breakthroughs in, say, agricultural uh, trade regulation and uh, what there is there. Um, the EU can be um, in, in the new context of the emerging food crisis, you know, maybe it can be a partner there. Uh, um, many, many questions there, but I do think that these connect in a certain way, and I would like to hear some of your thoughts in any order. Um, yeah, but maybe in the speaking order is yeah. more productive. Either way is <coughs> okay, thank you very much. I think a lot of, lot of questions, and the question is, whether whether I can suggest a very short answer uh, on, on on this, but I, I think I think definitely we see like indirect influence of China towards and which also affects our policies. Our I mean European uh, our uh, European policies towards other countries or even even continents. Uh, the first example that I think also you used already, it's our relations, our future relations with, with Africa. And just speaking about economic relations, we've seen quite, quite recent and also quite stable economic integration and uh, in the different regions of Africa, which also 
which is the successful conclusion on Africa and FDA. So now the question is for the Europeans, how do we see future, uh, future of trade relations in terms of the future trade agreement probably with Africa? Should we start negotiations quite soon or whether we should wait for the further economic integration of Africa and to see, to monitor how successfully they will be implementing the African FDA. But also at the same time, we have presence of China and Africa, different country, which spent already a number of years investing in the different countries, which building and, and creating access or even owning the access to the raw materials, which are crucial for our future economic development. We saw even the military presence of the, of the Russian troops, be the private troops or government uh, troops in, in different countries. And, 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 and these external forces, I think, uh, speed up internal considerations in the EU about, about the future that we should build with, with African countries and, and, and also probably to speed our uh, negotiations on, 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 on future trade, uh, trade agreement with Africa. Uh, similar, similar moves we have or we see in other Asian, the, uh, Eastern Asian countries. I think these markets and these countries are very important for the EU. But there are very different reasons why we still have not concluded in FTAs as with, with these countries, be it economic reasons or consequences, or be it political consequences uh, of some countries. But even the, seeing the China's activism in the region, I think also the well, it's, it's obvious for the, for the EU politicians, for the EU leaders, that we should be present in the region as well. Uh, future of uh, the, the, the international relations and then whether these questions could go in parallel, it's, it's, it's difficult to answer. For now, as I said in my introductory remarks, I would like the international, the global international organizations, be it UN or be it the, the World Trade Organization, to be, to be more active, but also to be honest, we, we saw some challenges that, that these organizations experience and well, I know I know the World Trade Organization from inside. I've been I've been the Lithuanian experimental representative in Geneva for four years and then I've seen I've I've, I've seen the Russia succession but I've seen the recent negotiations and debates in the organization. I think the organization has a huge internal difficulties and that's that's why I don't see the organization very active and then the different challenges that we have to deal currently. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, a, a very big question, of course, that's difficult to address. Um, but, uh, well, building on, on, on your, where you ended, actually, the, the WTO, the, the World Trade Organization is, of course, extremely important. But, but let's be fair, it's regulating trade in goods, right? Digital trade and services trade is are increasingly uh, bigger parts of, of trade between countries, and that is not yet regulated in a proper multilateral framework, not even within the WTO. So, in that sense, you know, the relevance of the e, uh, of the WTO, as it is not able to really reinvent itself and to adjust, um, I think, in the, in the world that we are in, that is uh, that is a, a huge challenge. So, in the meantime, what I actually see happening. Um, and I would be very curious to hear what it looks like from your perspective, is, is a shift from institutions to networks. Uh, so countries are less investing in institutions that they see are not delivering, including the WTO. Um, and uh, they are increasingly invested in creating new networks. And uh, of course, in, in Asia, that is you know, the, the quad, uh, the, the network what, that connects uh, that China says it encircles it, uh, but that connects the United States and Japan and India and Australia. Um, that is a really interesting development. Um, also connected to Europe is the supply chain initiative um, and, uh, or the supply chain network, where you have also countries cooperating to diversify away from China, to have a different type of globalization, um, not just looking inward, but having that open strategic autonomy that uh, the Netherlands likes uh, to, to, uh, to promote 
um, as we speak about increasingly uh, about strategic autonomy also in EU context. Um, so emphasizing that this should not be just looking inward and towards within the EU, but still have a, an, an open view, working with key partners on how exactly to do that and working with also the private sector, uh, because they, of course, are a very important uh, player in this, um, is, is increasingly important here. So I see, in that sense, a shift, a different way in which we engage specific institutions and how we are creating new alternatives. Um, at the same time, I see a shift, and this is not uh, because we want it, because, but unfortunately because uh, we have no better alternatives, from sometimes a rules-based approach to a principles-based approach. Um, and I think even in the WTO context, this is uh, even being discussed because it's so difficult to get to new rules. You're, what is happening now is that groups of countries are trying to get to uh, agreement on principles, how to or still organize trade. Um, and that is obviously, you know, the, the less preferred way because ideally, you know, given companies, the, the, the predictability in economic system is extremely important and that would be, you know, for that they would benefit from rules, not so much from principles because principles still allow for ambiguity um, and in, in policies. Um, but since, again, it's so difficult to get to rules, um, the, the focus, I think, should be on principles. When I first mentioned this in the Netherlands, um, in, a, in a discussion also on the WTO, um, it was a no-go area. I see more and more openness, again, uh, of the, towards this, uh, just because we have to, because otherwise there's going to be nothing. Uh, and, and based on what are we going to, to discuss things with each other. Um, so there I see a difference also between the previous panel where you have, you know, the US, um, you know, very much uh, uh, embedded in, in Europe through NATO. Um, in the economic field, uh, we have issues with China, obviously, but we also have issues with the United States. And for that reason, we also have issues with calling this a, a battle of autocracies and democracies, because let's be honest, democracies has not, have, have not been looking beautiful, so, uh, you know, also in, in the West. Um, and uh, the, the attack at um, the, the Capitol Hill, of course, that we all remember, uh, in January, uh, when was it, 2020, um, is, is, is one example, but, but even in Europe, we have examples of this. So rather than calling this democracies versus autocracies, let's, let's think of it as uh, like-minded countries because that allows us also the flexibility to indeed work with India, um, which is, uh, you know, in, in terms of label of democracy, but let's face it, it's not the type of democracy that we would like it to be. Um, but we need to cooperate with them uh, and we need to find ways actually to still coordinate with them also about the Ukraine, uh, India also stay, abstained, of course, uh, in, in, in the voting um, on, on the Ukraine uh, issue in the United Nations context. Um, but we still need them uh, on board. So we cannot, uh, we, we want China to be different um, in, uh, in speaking out about this war, but we also need that of, of other players. And I think that's um, important issues. Um, so what Europe is investing in, and again, in this promote agenda uh, that I'm really curious, I know the Estonians are very, um, very active on trusted digital connectivity. Uh, and the EU is investing heavily in digital partnerships. Um, and it is, this is, I think, also with all the knowledge that, uh, that, that Lithuania must also have in this field dealing with hybrid warfare, is that an issue also that, uh, that Lithuania could be more active in? Um, or also outside of EU borders um, and beyond, uh, of course, dealing with Russia? Um, that, is a, that is a question. The Netherlands is now very much looking to create space for itself in specific fields. Uh, and we are, have been very active also in the, in the cyber domain, I think also in the promote agenda of, of digital economy. Um, how do we connect better digital economy? Uh, for example, in the fintech space, the Netherlands has also a very thriving fintech community. Um, can we uh, link them better to, to what is happening, for example, in Southeast Asia? Um, as a way of sort of a needs-driven approach from bottom up, helping these countries with an alternative because they are dealing with that very big country that is uh, bringing more of an autocratic system, uh, including an autocratic digital uh, um, system, um, and they're looking for those alternatives. And again, this is very much still in the making, um, so it's uh, something that we're looking forward to, but also here I see that EU member states can ca carve out and, and act on their own strengths, 
um, as we are trying to do in the cyber domain or in digital connectivity, um, as well as, by the way, in, in, in maritime uh, and rules-based order um, in the Indo-Pacific. I'm, I'm very interested to learn also about what Lithuania is, is planning to do in that field, if anything at all, because there's, uh, this is also a matter of prioritizations, of course. Um, well, uh, I hope you have a productive uh, day ahead of you learning about these things. I don't know if this uh, panel discussion is the most appropriate venue, but I would like to uh, touch the question of the you know, coherence between Lithuanian and Dutch positions, because there are clearly, uh, you know, we t we've talked about the Hanseatic League, and there are many issues on which the Netherlands beyond trade CITI with Lithuania, but in the past couple of weeks, you know, the Dutch have occupied a little bit of a bet noir position in terms of enlargement, a little bit of a, you know, um, reticence uh, by the Hague on the question of how quickly uh, Ukraine would be accepted, I think it was not very well received in Lithuania. And there are many such different issues, but then at the same time, I see that the Dutch are well ahead in what the Lithuania is trying to position itself to be, which is trying to carve out a space in the semiconductor global value chains. So there are, you know, both very practical areas where agreement is not only possible, but sharing of expertise could really uh, have a value add dimension. Also deep, uh, deep, sometimes principled disagreements. And I wonder to what extent those two can be compartmentalized and cooperation can move forward. Um, and in those areas where we do move forward, what would the priorities be? Let's take that question now and then I hope in the meetings with the, our officials you'll have a more de detailed answers later, but now just at least very briefly discuss that. Thank you. Thank you for the second question. Interesting. Uh, well, I think I think cooperation is definitely needed, and then the issues that you mentioned are all important. I think. Well, what's what's obvious when we speak about EU domestic or internal politics, it's not for two countries uh, to decide, but it's enough for two countries to take a lead on the very specific issues and then to create a big alliance. And, and, and to have the decision adopted. Uh, I think, well, starting from the, from the similarities, uh, one of the latest legislative initiatives that I've mentioned in my introductory remarks, EU anti-course, economic anti-coercive instrument, uh, well, my understanding is that we have very common understanding and the position why the instrument is urgently needed and I think, well, uh, but we, in, in, but the, in the current debate, we still, I think, need a broader and bigger support from the from the different angles and corners and then capitals of the EU. This is this is one of the example. Oh well, semiconductors another obvious issue, and I think we don't need to spend much time saying and explaining how it's important for 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 the whole EU, for our industry's future of economy. And, but also probably, well, about, about, similar, uh, about not about similarities, but about the d differences that we still, uh, still have. And, and then there are, I think, interesting and kind of topics, topics that, that should be definitely discussed and then starting from the bilateral dialogue. Uh, could be could be about the future and then EU enlargements, and I obviously personally agree. It's not only about Ukraine; it's also a question of Balkans. I've, I've I've spent some years also working as as independent expert in Balkan countries, be it a Kosovo, be it a Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I know these countries and I, from inside. I know these people from inside. I've been working directly with the trade ministers in different countries. And, and these difficulties that I see currently in these countries are very deep in my heart personally. And then obviously, I would like seeing Europe more active dealing with these difficulties, not to face huge, huge problems, let's say, in the, in, in the nearest future. Uh, some some other issues. Well, the, the 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 huge question that we have inside the EU: how we 
could promote our trade agreements in the future, whether the trade agreement should be about mercantilistic issues, the simple trade, how much we should add some other topics and issues in these agreements. Well, we know how difficult it is to sell these agreements to the wider society, starting not, I, I don't even mention the TTAB, probably everybody forget about the CETA, but also the, the recent agreement with, with Mercosur, etc. But I've, I've participated in some debates with, uh, uh, with the wider society, and interesting enough, all the, all, all the claims, all, all the opposition that I, I heard on, on about these agreements uh, came because of non-trade concerns. So my key question is, what are these trade agreements should stay within the usual and all type the trade area, or should we expand and bring in uh, uh, new topics into these agreements? And this is, I think, it's common interest of, of it could be a common interest of the uh, Lithuania and Netherlands uh, to discuss and to see how we can shape and, and present our policies. Also, well, about the future of our relations with some, some countries, Central Asian countries, not, not China, I think we have a quite good and common understanding how we're supposed to shape our future relations with China. But looking more closely in the countries which have well, closer to the EU, I mean, for example, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, huge, important countries. Uh, thinking about the future of Russia, not mentioning, uh, seeing the Eurasian Economic Union and integration in that region. So I think we should start already internal debate in the EU. How do we see our future with these countries whether and then questioning and waiting probably for some time, uh, waiting for these countries to, f to, to, to finish their internal thinking and let them decide whether they still see uh, partners with Russia or whether they would like to move or to shift a bit closer to the EU and the question lays what the EU can offer to these countries, to the region. I think this is a quite, quite quite a debate that we should start in, inside in the EU. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, as I said, this is my first time to visit Lithuania, so on the similarities and, and the differences, that, that would be very difficult uh, for me to say very sensible things about. Um, I'll be very honest. Uh, but again, realizing uh, how in, in the EU China policy has now moved up the agenda as it is at least um, on the minds of everybody. Um, I think even despite the immediate crisis that we're now going through, that, is, uh, that remains an issue that I think everybody wants to address. Um, the lack of sort of dissonance on, on the Indo-Pacific policy, which went through very smoothly for EU terms, that I think is, is, is truly remarkable. Uh, but that was perhaps also because there was no concrete action um, in that uh, strategy. So again, it's a call for a needs-driven approach, uh, dealing with you know what is the challenges that, that we that we recognise and and what what countries can offer what alternatives. Um, and here I understand it's a different prioritization. If you're in this uh, part of Europe, you will be looking more at Central European countries. Uh, and for the Netherlands, which has close trade ties and investment ties with uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, we will also be looking at, at that region. Um, so that's, uh, I think, interesting also to, to compare notes and to understand uh, the needs, uh, because in the Netherlands, um, again, our focus and uh, priorities has, has been different. Um, but perhaps there's more that we should be doing uh, in, in Central Asia. I know at least that the EU Connectivity Ambassador, uh, she went there uh, very regularly. Uh, she was also calling for, for more attention to this. And this, uh, to my mind, has now uh, abided in, in um, terms of uh, attention. So that is, again, comparing notes, but then also on, on the unity, because we all agree that this, this new policies towards China require more EU unity. How do we get to that? And what is uh, what could be undermining this um, is, is, I think, uh, key questions uh, to ask. Um, and 
before we take certain steps. Again, I, I'm, I'm very happy to see that now everybody is standing uh, behind Lithuania on this crisis, immediate crisis that you have with China. Uh, the economic co coercion that is very disproportionate uh, is, is inexcusable, and, and it's important that all EU countries uh, combine uh, or uh, step up uh, against this um, and re reply to this. But at the same time, I wonder, you know, has there been um, uh, coordination with the EU about actually this step of, uh, you know, the, the, the sensitivities of staying within the one China policy as, as who defines it, because we all have different interpretations of this, obviously. I think that's also important issues that, that should be discussed more between EU member states before big steps uh, like uh, the opening of a an, of an, uh, of an Taiwanese or a Taipei representative office uh, are being made. And I'm, I'm telling this from also from our experience. Of course, the Netherlands changed the name of our own office in Taiwan uh, just in, in May 2020. Uh, this was uh, far uh, you know, far smaller of a step uh, compared to uh, what, what Lithuania did because we changed the name from the Netherlands Trade and Investment Office um, to a Netherlands office in Taipei, uh, not in Taiwan, but in Taipei. Uh, so it is acknowledging that our relations with Taiwan run far deeper than trade and investment. Um, and they also, you know, encompass uh, cultural ties, education, and also strategic issues. So I think that was uh, an important step. Uh, but it was also a conscious step not to make that uh, a Netherlands office in Taiwan. And again, if the, if the impact on, uh, on, on the consequences of, of steps uh, like this, that also the, the Netherlands then took, uh, are for all of the EU to bear and will have then an impact on, uh, on EU unity, I think it's important that we coordinate these issues also better. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to see what is, what is in the making there already, what's the thinking in, in, in Lithuania on this, um, and to get to a more coherent China policy. Because if anything, uh, and already now we have the EU-China summit, of course, upcoming this Friday, and we know that the Chinese are trying to cozy up with the EU again to drive a wedge between the United States and the EU. So this is not just an EU internal issue, it's also between the EU and the US. Um, that's something that we very much have to look at. And we have created that uh, EU-US Trade and Technology Council that is really deepening ties and really helping us not to always get on the same line, but at least to, uh, to better understand each other and to coordinate approaches. Um, and I think, uh, well, I, yeah, sometimes I, I, I wonder what are the, the intra-EU mechanisms for also that coordination. We have, of course, um, you know, many EU committees to discuss many things, but are we also looking at the bigger picture sufficiently? Thank you so much, and thank you for uh, mentioning TTC. There are just so many questions we still could go through, um, and I do need to get it, uh, give the chance for the audience to ask theirs, but I cannot, I wouldn't permit myself uh, to not ask one more question, which is, Despite all the paradigm shifts in uh, trade policy, it still should be, we think it should be, about, uh, you know, customers, citizens, uh, firms, exporters, importers, uh, that is, it has to be societally useful and efficient. And uh, the big question now with the, you know, trade taking on the geoeconomic, geopolitical dimension is how to ensure societal buy-in support as it gets tough, as it gets costly. And I wonder, what the key challenges here are, but also what the key opportunities are. Because, you know, sanctioning Russia and transitioning away from the dependency on fossil fuels is both a massive challenge, you know, uh, of societal mobilization, but also a huge opportunity for both concentrated industries and sort of for consumers and so on and so forth. Um, similarly, with China, you know, reorganizing the global value chains is a huge, uh, you know, pain, but at the same time, it is a possible proliferation of new economic uh, ties. So I wonder, what do you see in the sort of short to medium term uh, future as the key steps that you need to take to ensure that there is no societal backlash against the more assertive stance that it takes, and also to maximize the opportunities that these changes bring to our customers, our firms, etc. And then we'll give it to the audience. Yeah, 
uh, the sanctions we apply against Russia and China and, uh, and, and that relations with, with China and then moving from China. I think we're not still in, in the position moving away from China. Well, we, we know that some global value chains causes difficulties. We, we, in the EU, we try to prevent these difficulties and to create alternatives, but um, I'm, I'm still, for today, I'm refusing to accept an argument that they're moving from, from China. Russia, this is another issue. I think we can, we can start from agreeing that Russia is not so important and big uh, global uh, player in terms of foreign trade, of international trade. Of course, for us, for the EU, Russia is a very close market. Russia is important supplier or exporter of certain raw materials, be it gas, but also steel products, etc., etc. So the, the cost. Uh, the cost, and do we accept these costs? Uh, I think, well, we have, we have war going in Ukraine, and, and we had already discussions, at least in Lithuania, oh, well, I'm not speaking of the general society, the, the companies, the private companies, and the, all the companies the next day said that, of course, we accept the cost of the war. And that's that's end of the story, and then you cannot do anything else. Well, coming back and imagine how whether it could be different without war, absolutely yes. Well, I think well, if we speak about trade relations that you used to have with Russia, the different strategies, etc. I think we hadn't had any strategy how the future relations could, could look like with Russia, I, I mean the pre-war times, right? They exceeded, well, they exceeded the World Trade Organization, but even, well, the question is whether they exceeded or whether us Europeans and Americans brought them to the, to the WTO expecting that the China, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Russia will change in the future. And, and then in a few years, we understood that they're not going to change. So the question was how many difficulties we can have and then uh, how long we can survive with the different difficulties, how many trade disputes we can start against them and, and the WTO and then, and then in general, even looking back into pre-war times, for a number of years, we've been living with different sanctions and, and agricultural embargo. So I, I, I think slowly we tried, we already were used to these, to these costs. Of course, these, these costs were quite different. And we've seen, we've seen some cost and increase in prices caused by their, by their COVID pandemic. And, and then obviously you understand that you cannot do more. And then, and then the question is, and the answer is, that we still have to fight for the free trade. We have to fight for the new markets to reduce these costs. And, and, then, and then I think, if I remember well, the, the Trade Commission of the EU a couple of weeks ago said, it's, well, still, we don't have another tool. We still need to promote trade. We need to promote trade agreements and then looking at the future stability, independence of the EU still lies on the traditional trade flows and trade agreements that we're still about to conclude in the future. Thank you. Yes, well, I cannot agree more, obviously. Uh, we, we, we still want that, but at the same time, there's all these protect policies that are being, uh, being implement, implemented or being uh, designed. And indeed, we need societal buy-in for that. I think that's extremely important. Bob just referenced the uh, Klingendal barometer. Uh, you know, looked at looked at Russia and asked, they looked at you know, are, are Dutch people willing to sacrifice? Um, and and yes, they are. Um, on China, actually, we also did uh, a barometer uh, check, and we asked. Uh, and one of the findings was that on, uh, for example, on, on telecommunications networks, and do you? Yeah, how, how much is it worth to you to, to not have the Chinese in our networks? Um, and most of the people responded um, that 
yes, the telecommunications, the, the, the big networks, we want them out, but that Chinese phone, I'm still gonna buy. And, and that is a really silly thing if you think of it, because the issues that they would have with the, the systems that the government buys, you, you could have a similar challenge with your phone, you know, could also be compromised. So I think it, the, the challenge here is to make people understand and to make companies understand, to make civil society understand that they are part of this. This is not happening outside in, in, in a system that they're just looking at. Um, they are part of this and they have responsibility also. Every individual, every consumer as a citizen, they have a responsibility also to take and they cannot just leave that with the government. And I think this is a challenge that the Dutch government is now really looking at because in terms of China policy in, in a matter of just two year or two or three years, we went from a very white and open picture of, you know, China is, you know, a beautiful free market and we're gonna make uh, big profits there to a very bleak and black picture of China. China. And I think, uh, you know, the shades of gray are really important here. That's what we should focus on. And that's difficult for people really to, to grasp. Um, so we have to get uh, first a better understanding, I think, of opinions. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm very happy that we are, have, have started that at Klingendal to better understand what people think, because that has to be a starting point also in having discussions and then having a conversation with them uh, and, and outreach also from the government. Uh, right? It, there's so much knowledge um, with policymakers. Uh, shouldn't they also be more, you know, speaking out more themselves? And then, should, can we exchange more knowledge uh, so that we, as think tanks, also have better, uh, are better, more capable of, of, of speaking out on certain issues? I think that's really important. At the same time, private sector, and I want to end there because that's extremely important. Um, because the for example, technological innovation that might that used to be within the military complex where the governments were, were steering innovation, basically. Now technological innovation is done in private sector and the government does not know until innovations are out, are put on the market, and that's when it's too late to really get to good regulation. So also for that reason, we need to cooperate much more with the private sector. Um, China is doing this, is, is a great uh, competitor in this field. I think in that sense, uh, what somebody said in the EU many years ago, trade is not so much the issue. We have institutions for that. They're not functioning uh, all, always very well, but we have at least um, instruments there. Uh, in the other fields, we, we have less of that. So we have to know and, and to better understand the challenges and work with you know, what's sometimes called trusted communities. Um, that incorporate also the private sector and government uh, uh, officials, as well as civil society. Um, because you know, the many hacking initiatives, I think now that also show that civil society can play a role in influencing you know, public opinion and uh, is, is, is really uh, extremely a valuable tool also that we can make much more use of. And here Taiwan is actually a great example of, of how they've been doing that. Absolutely, um, thank you so much. And my biggest apologies, but because we started the session a little uh, later, um, the audience questions will be, I hope, uh, developed in a sort of more informal way, but uh, we have to end the formal part of the session now. If you still have uh, the time for the ambassador to give a concluding remark. Thank you so, so much for your insights and uh, for a productive agenda on future dialogues. And it was a pleasure uh, joining you for this event and uh, I look forward to our other discussions ahead. A lot. We had uh, some uh, provoking discussions uh, with, the, with the panelists. I'm looking forward um, uh, to continue these discussions tonight at the Night Owl session uh, at the residence. Um, it is clear that the EU um, uh, is facing uh, different uh, geopolitical uh, challenges. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the answer lies in further cooperation within the EU and with, 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 with our transatlantic partners. Uh, it's not either or, it is and, and. Um, of course, the EU member states should bolster its security and defense cooperation, and we will have to continue investing in our transatlantic uh, relationship. Um, the cooperation um, uh, uh, 
No, let me say something else, which I, I picked up from, from the discussion, uh, and it was something that, that really stuck to, uh, with me, and it's, uh, we have to try harder, um, uh, uh, and we should not uh, give up, because um, the difficulties um, of multilateralism and, and consensus building um, uh, is, um, is, Im is important, um, and it gives us the strength and the security uh, at, at times that we needed the most. Um, over the past year, we have seen um, over and over again that our strength lies in this di diversity. In times of peace, we should build the foundations of our unity and our solidarity. We need, um, uh, uh, we should, sorry, in times of, of peace, we should build the foundations of our unity and solidarity, which we need in times um, of uh, in times that our uh, our foundations and organisations are threatened, um, and this cooperation between the Netherlands and Lithuania um, is a key example um, uh, of how we can strengthen those foundations. Um, we've seen it in many occasions. Um, for example, just very concrete examples like the cyber and military mobility cooperation we have between our countries. Um, we realize as the Netherlands, um, and I think as the EU, that our borders, that your borders are our borders, that your security is our security, and that your future is our future. Thank you so much, and um, I'm looking forward to tonight. Thank you. for coming here and have a nice day.